What is the major problem that confronts Africa? I think that uh, one major problem that I see is copying foreign economic models or ideologies. Please educate us on that. You're that, an economist, so that, please feel that, free and... <laughs> that don't, don't really work. Yeah. Now, Give when, us examples. Uh, for example, during when uh, the current government in Uganda took power, we were completely without foreign exchange. And our shops were empty, we couldn't <coughs> buy medicines, we couldn't import medicines and other necessities. And so we were on our knees and had to, 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 to beg, as it were, to get aid from the World Bank and the IMF and other countries. But this aid came with conditionalities. Conditionalities, <laughs> as usual. And the conditionalities were more severe than we thought. You know, when you're hungry and somebody says, uh, I'll give you food provided. Yeah. You, you promise you swallow yeah, it without in, asking. In the Bible, we know <laughs> the story of Jacob and Esau. Yeah. He said, What do I care about the birthright when I'm dying? Absolutely. Just give me food. Yeah. Prof, are you hopeful about the future of Africa? That's a hard question. <laughs> I pray <laughs> very hard for the future of Africa. Interesting. So I will not give up on Africa. So you are, you are hopeful? I'm very hopeful. Very hopeful. Welcome to the Religion and Enterprise Television, where we discuss issues to do with small and medium scale enterprises, as far as they are related to the Africa continental free trade area and the Agenda 2063. Today, we are privileged to be in Kampala, the capital city of the Republic of Uganda in East Africa. And we are talking to a very accomplished economist and the chancellor of the Makerere University, as well as the former finance minister of the Republic of Uganda, in the person of Professor Ezra Surema, a very accomplished economist, and we are privileged to have him. Prof, it is an honor, a great honor for this television station to have you on our set. Thank you. And, uh, you know, when, when I was researching a bit about you, I was fascinated that in spite of all that you've accomplished, you're very down to earth, very humble. So I'll start off by asking if you could tell us a little bit about yourself. But after you've said everything, please, if you can end it up with what makes you so humble, despite having seen it all, and having done it all, and yet you are so down to earth, which is something that we don't normally see among our accomplished Africans. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tumi. It's a great pleasure and privilege uh, to be here with you today. Thank you for the opportunity for this interview. Um, I come from a very, very humble beginning. My father was a catechist in the church. Uh, that's probably about as low as you can get in, in, in the church. He had uh, six churches usually that he'd be looking after. Today it would be an archdeaconary, but at that time it was a parish. It was considered to be a parish. So I used to, to walk very long distances to go to school. So I learned to, to, to know that life was not easy. It never has been. And uh, by God's grace, I was able to, to get uh, a good education and uh, to, to advance to, to teach at the university which I never imagined in my life. <laughs> but when I gave my life to God in 1960, hmm. uh, the Lord recently told me that he has been guiding my life ever since. Absolutely. And uh, that's why I, I have achieved whatever I have achieved. And I have not achieved it on my own, by the grace of God. The grace. That I, I have done what I have done. 
after completing secondary school in Uganda, I was able to obtain a scholarship to go to America. I went to a Jesuit institution, even though here I was in charge of Uganda schools. I'm not sure how I, I didn't choose it, they chose me. Fordham University in the city of New York. At the age of 20, I found myself in the city of New York. I was uh, completely lost, but uh, not totally. I, I, I managed to find my way to do a bachelor's and master's there, and later on obtain a scholarship to complete a PhD at the University of Connecticut. And then I came to my career to teach. I got involved in politics because at, uh, initially, in the 70s, uh, during Idi Amin's time, uh, teaching was very hard at Makerere. The environment was tough. People were getting killed. And academic uh, intellectuals were the target. Wow. Why that? Uh, so he, 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 uh, Idi Amin was not educated. Ah. And he feared educated people. Mm -hmm. But uh, when I was, I was able to return to America to finish my PhD, I did not return until 1979, when he was uh, overthrown by forces from Tanzania and the Ugandans. So then uh, we started politics, because the situation in Uganda was not good, 1979. In 1980, we, we had created a new political party called Uganda Patriotic Movement. And uh, we lost, we only got one candidate to parliament. <laughs> but the elections were openly rigged. And the gentleman who was in charge of the government, Mr. Mwanga at the time, took over the powers of the Electoral Commission and announced publicly that only he would announce the results of the elections. And he announced that his party had won. So for those of us who are in the opposition, they started looking for us. The army came for me at Makere, and I had to, by grace, I escaped and went to exile until 1987. That's when I returned to Uganda, this time at the Central Bank. I was a director of research. I later on became deputy governor. And later on, I was in the party as a secretary for economic affairs. And after that, I became minister and so on. So it's been a long journey, Interesting. but uh, I thank God for the opportunity to be here. Let me say congratulations, Prof. Thank you. Uh, it's, been, it's been such an interesting journey, as you have mentioned. Yes. And uh, only few people can survive this sort of uh, challenges, particularly when you, know, you are being sought for you know, by the military. And as you mentioned, it is grace that has kept you, and uh, we thank God for, for what he has done. Let me start off by with your background in economics. If you look at all the changes that have taken place in the world, particularly the last 10 years, what are the implications for you, for Africa in particular? I welcome the, uh, the, the uh, global changes in, in uh, competition and the economic and political power. Of course, during the 60s and 70s and 80s and 90s, uh, we had uh, a Cold War between mainly Russia and America. And we were on a tightrope on how to manage, because if you made a mistake, especially here in Africa, you, 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 you'd fall. And, uh, and we know that many of our leaders were victims of, of that problem. So Russia, of course, became uh, disintegrated. The Soviet Union uh, disintegrated. And we had America rising as a unipolar global power. But now what we see emerging is China as a competitor. And uh, I think yesterday in the United Nations, uh, President Biden uh, indicated that they wanted to compete peacefully with China. So he, he recognized it. He accepted China as a competitor. Uh, so 
I think this uh, competition has some important implications for us in Africa because it means that uh, instead of, of uh, hanging, if you like, at the mercy of one global imperial power, yeah. we have a bit of room for maneuver, uh, particularly with regard to, to financing, but also in terms of uh, political uh, stability. So I, I welcome uh, the, the changing, my world becoming more polar, and I hope that Africa will have some breathing room, as it were, to, to grow and become stronger. That's, that's, that's very interesting. Let me take you back a little bit, uh, because if you look at the issues of, let's say, COVID, oh. uh, COVID, 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 when COVID struck, <coughs> and uh, you know, the, now Africa has to depend solely, and then in the Ukraine war, where we are looking at wheat and, you know, all of that from Ukraine and they are not coming and all of that. Are there some key lessons that you think that, as a continent, we need to take a serious look at for us to prepare ourselves as we go into the 2020, 2063 as a continent? Yes, uh, certainly I think that, um uh, there has been a great deal of talk about wheat coming from Ukraine. Uh, I think that Africa is capable of food security and should really take a, a lesson and, and uh, have a serious program for, for storage of food, of grains, uh, because for us in Uganda here, for example, we have big seasons of, of maize and prices drop drastically and, and maize becomes almost worthless. But somehow we are not able to store that maize and save it and stabilize prices so that in the future, when maize is not so plentiful, we are able to continue to have a good harvest. The prices of, uh, of what we call a posho, which is the, the, the flower for maize, are now extremely high uh, because we have not been able to arrange this kind of uh, security program. So I, I think that uh, one lesson I would hope that all Africans would take from these wars, for example, is, is food security. As a minimum, Africa should be food secure. For, for me to hear that African countries are depending on Ukraine, I, I feel ashamed because I believe Africa has uh, already environmental requirements for having, for being a, a net exporter of food rather than a net importer of food and for providing food to countries like Sudan now and, and Somalia, which are having uh, severe uh, conflicts and need support. I, I was tempted to ask whether you are still a politician, but I, I figure you are no more in active politics. So let me ask it the other way around. Which year were you the finance minister, if you don't mind? I was finance minister from 2005 to 2009. Nine. Yes. So <coughs> I asked that specifically. I just wanted to find out. From the time you were the minister and now, have you seen any major change? I mean, we are using Uganda as an example, because as you know, this, the economic structure of most African countries are the same. So between the time you have the finance minister and now, if there has not been any change from the standpoint of the examples you gave, storage of you know, our food and everything, and it's spread all over the, in Ghana where I come from, sometimes we import tomatoes from Burkina Faso, and yet we have the first land in the northern part of Ghana where we could have grown tomatoes. In fact, we even import onions in tons, millions of dollars. So the question is, if after all these years, we are not doing it, from your standpoint, what is the major problem that confronts Africa? I think that uh, one major problem that I see is copying foreign economic models or ideologies. Please educate us on that. You're that, an economist, so that, please feel free. And that <laughs> don't, don't really work. Yeah. 
Now, give when, us examples. Uh, for example, during when uh, the current government in Uganda took power, we were completely without foreign exchange. And our shops were empty, we couldn't <coughs> buy medicines, we couldn't import medicine and other necessities. And so we were on our knees and had to, 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 to beg, as it were, to get aid from the World Bank and the IMF and other countries. But this aid came with conditionalities. Conditionalities, <laughs> as usual. And the conditionalities were more severe than we thought. You know, when you're hungry and somebody says, uh, I'll give you food provided, yeah. you, you probably you swallow yeah, it without in, asking. In the Bible, we know <laughs> the story of Jacob and Esau. Yeah. He said, What do I care about the birthright when I'm dying? Absolutely. Just give me food. Yeah. And that's what happened here that uh, we were forced to adopt a liberal economic framework and get rid of virtually all state institutions, bank, cooperatives, uh, marketing boards, and like coffee marketing board, lint marketing board. And so now you find that uh, those institutions, for example, the Produce Marketing Board, which was gathering food and buying food and storing it from, from, from the farmers, was uh, got rid of in privatization and liberalization. But now there is no substitute. So you find that farmers have nowhere to, to sell their goods or they sell at very low prices because they are at the mercy of middlemen and, and prices collapse. And, and so they, they are virtually giving away their produce. So this, this is, so the organizational uh, issue is, is a great problem, in my opinion. Which ideology should we follow? And, and I think that uh, many of us are realizing that we need to come up with our own ideology. But when, Prof? When? When? When do we do that? I'm asking when because, I mean, Currently, if you look at the IMF you know, shadow, most African countries are indebted to IMF and the World Bank. So the model that you have just described hasn't changed for all these years. When are we going to have that paradigm shift? And what do we well, need to do? Well, your question earlier was about the multiple <laughs> world. Yes. <laughs> yes. And in the multiple world, we have not only capitalism, <laughs> we also have socialism. Socialism, yes as another model. Right. And some people would say maybe we could also have a synthesis, uh, a middle ground. Even for the Western world, they no longer say that laissez faire, live alone and only let the private, even the government gets involved when there is need. So in our case, I think that uh, we need to have more programming of our, of our activities. We, we can't depend on, on laser fare, on you simply produce and you hope there will be a market. No, we need more contract-based production. People produce, they have contracts, and they, this indicates the prices at which they will uh, supply their product. And, and this would stabilize the markets for our farmers. And of course, uh, introducing new technologies in production and so on. Prof, again, I mean, I like the, the, the point you made about agriculture. Here in Uganda, if you crack these uh, tiles and put maize here, or even matoki, and come back six months' time, you are happy to have something to eat. But we seem not to be giving attention. I was reading the Lee Kuan Yew's book, From Third World to First Nation, and he gave a very interesting analogy about Ghana, that when he visited Ghana, where I come from, he was shocked to see that the universities that Ghana has established, where none of them were focusing on agriculture, even though Ghana is a nation that has vast lands that can be used to develop agriculture. We focus more on theoretical stuff, and not agriculture. Are we getting something wrong as a continent? Because if we are going to become the food basket of the continent, of the world, what must we do right? 
Certainly, we must uh, understand, we must define the problem. And if the problem is food security, for example, then we need to be focusing on solving the problem than on uh, theoretical things in the air. People study them, and they come out of school, and they can't even uh, use a hoe, they, or they despise the hoe. They say, now they're educated. We should only write the hoes for the uneducated. I, I think that uh, focusing on defining the problems and then developing solutions to those problems, rather than what we have done is, of course, we we came I when I, we became independent in 1962. I was in uh, senior senior two or senior one uh, in school. And and we are only learning of Cambridge, English. <laughs> yeah, the syllabus. And this continues. <coughs> yeah. So, are we solving Cambridge problems? Or are we solving Uganda? <laughs> I like that question. Uh, but, Prof, don't you think that question should be put to you as a chancellor of the Macquarie University? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, we have we have attempted to to uh, transform Macquarie into a research Absolutely. university. And, and I, I'm glad about that shift by Professor Nawangwe because we are saying that we need to create knowledge or add to the knowledge so that we are solving real problems that we face rather than just uh, reading and, and, and things for the, just passing exams on paper when in fact we don't have the capacity to solve real problems. And, and that shift in the curriculum is overdue. We have been late. Too many children have come out of school with this type of knowledge that cannot solve problems. And so we are lost. And because before we thought that if you went to school, you came out, you automatically get a job. Now we know that's not true. So the question is, what should we do? And I believe later on you uh, will come to that. We'll come to that. Sure. Yeah. That's interesting. That's just interesting. I mean, I'm, I'm happy, you know, we just had a conversation with the CEO, as I mentioned, of the Federation of uh, Uganda's Employees of Uganda. <clears throat> and he talked about the TVET concept in Uganda, which I thought was fantastic. So maybe when we come to the educational side and also the youth employment issue, we'll talk more about that. Prof, let's pay attention now to the Africa continental free trade area. From where you sit, and having been in politics for some time, are you concerned about the integration process so far? I mean, Africa Continental Free Trade Area has been on the drawing board for quite some time, but now it's almost about a year now when it was formalized and the Secretariat set up in Ghana. Now, but it looks as if a lot more need to be done to ensure that there's active trade among nations, movement of people, and all of that. You, what, what is going on in Africa? Um, I'm happy to say that uh, I have experience with the East African Regional Corporation. At one time I was secretary of a commission to accelerate uh, East African Federation. So my experience is that these matters are really complex. Uh, but we should not be discouraged because even though we appear to be really slow in making progress, there is actually progress. Uh, in, in, in East Africa, we have sometimes you take two steps forward and one step backward. For example, during the 70s, during the I mean the the, the East African Cooperation virtually came to a halt, but then the people who came after him revived it, and we've been struggling so hard to, 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 to we have added new nations, we've added Southern Sudan, now DRC has come in. I see this, and I think Somalia has applied. Oh, really? Yes, so I see Rwanda came in, Burundi came in, originally we were only three. Yeah. So there is some, some progress. We may not be, it's not, it's not problem free. 
Even Europe is a problem with Spain. You find the many problems here, you have Britain getting out of Brexit. So we should not be discouraged. So for me, the, the continental free trade area is a great step forward, a great idea. At least show the spirit of unity is strong and alive. And, and we know that this is where we want to move. We have a direction where we want to move. This doesn't mean we're not with problems. Doesn't mean we shall not have difficulties. Doesn't mean our enemies will not try to destroy us or distract us. But we have a direction. And this is the right direction. So what I have seen uh, in, in East Africa, in East and Africa, we have had many problems, we still have, but we have been making slow progress. And the focus and belief, conviction in unity, African unity, is strong. And I hope and I believe that even for the rest of the African continent, this conviction is strong that we need to come together as a people. And step by step, I hope we'll get there. But, but one of the key challenges, Prof, has been, I mean, if you take, for example, and as you mentioned, I agree with you, there's a lot of progress that's been made. I mean, now you have ECOWAS. I don't need a, I don't need a visa to go to Nigeria. I get it at the arrival. In, within the East African community, the same. I'm, sure, I'm told that you can even go to Rwanda from Uganda with your national ID yes. if you are not using the airport and stuff like that. But, Prof, the challenge is that most of our SMEs are the informal sector. Now, and you and I know that within the informal sector, for them to participate at a certain level within the continental free trade area is a challenge. So the question is, what are we not doing? Or what do we need to do? First, for the informal sector, is it capacity development? Is it technology? What do we need to do to ensure that we can, we can to some extent, formalize them, if you like, so they can participate actively in the Africa continental free trade area. Yes. Um, I'm afraid here that I feel that we have to take a step back and learn even from our colonial history. In Uganda here, we had a coffee marketing board and it would gather the coffee from all the farmers and process it and export it. So there was no question of it meeting the standard of the international market. And they would also make, set the price. They would even announce the price ahead of the season so that farmers would know what price would they would get and they would be encouraged. This was the marketing sure. board you mentioned earlier. Yes, else. yes. And similarly for the coffee, oh. lint marketing board. So these boards were able to aggregate and they had cooperatives under them. And these cooperatives were aggregating and sorting and drying and so, on, so that the product is brought to the standard. The, the farmer in, in my village cannot, is not able to do this. He doesn't have the knowledge, doesn't have the means. I have shed tears when I have been to the farm and seen maize being dried on the ground, in, in, in the soil. And I said, now, from here it goes in the bag, and from the bag it goes to the miller. Will the miller wash it? Yeah. I doubt it. Yeah. He'll just mill it, put it in the bag also, and send for full consumption. So there is a, a, a definite need for us to go back to this concept of aggregating, either through cooperatives, or through boards, so that these small farmers can have a place where they contract, supply, they get a stable price with the assistance of government, and then we can have our products. Our products are being refused by Southern Sudan, that the maize has aflatoxin, and Kenya also. And we, these are some of the problems that we are meeting. Why? Because we don't have this mechanism. We are relying on on demand and supply and the laser fair, the things will work themselves out. They won't. And we should learn and get away from this kind of model and, and, and help our, our, our citizens. We are talking, interestingly, about how we can get our 
small and medium scale enterprises in the informal sector to become active participants of the Africa continental free trade area. And Prof is you know, sharing with us a model that used to be in time past and he's advocating that perhaps for us to get the people in the, the SMEs in the informal sector, we need to go back there. Prof, I'm coming back to that same issue because I think it's a very interesting model that we've just introduced. But isn't it the same thing that the private sector is doing? Where you have individuals who have the money, the resources, and therefore buy, sometimes buy the seeds even for these farmers, and then they grow, they aggregate them, and then they export and pocket the, 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 the money for themselves and all of that. The challenge they do is that like you mentioned that these are middlemen, the actual producer doesn't have the actual benefit of the process because he gets just a peanut and then the whole money goes to the person. So, so the question is, with still within the framework of the continental free trade area, how do we get a lot of our people to be lifted from poverty to become active players in the process using the model that you have talked about? Who do we talk to? Is it government? Is it the policy makers or what? That's, that's a big question, <laughs> Doctor. It's a, it's a huge question. Of course, change comes about in many ways. There have to be interest groups, uh, the traders, the farmers, uh, religious organizations or faith organizations, the interest groups, who is interested in improving the well-being of the people. Those are the ones who will push and push and push until we can see change. So, uh, of course, we have to bear in mind that there are people who are benefiting from this current arrangement. Uh, those who feel that uh, this kind of market-driven arrangement is the best, and they are benefiting a great deal, they are billionaires, and then they don't see any problem. But uh, if we have other interest groups who can see the poverty and misery of our people and are willing to organize and, and, and push uh, government uh, or make political parties with this faith in order to, uh, to, to, to to implement this ideology, then so be it. But, but you know, we as a people, how I'll have to help ourselves. It's not going to come from outside. The outsiders, the, the ones who made us dissolve our boards and so on, they want us to continue like this because they benefit more from it. But we are not benefiting as much as we should. So, so the, the citizens are helpless the 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 intellect just you know people who know it like yourself it seems to me there's very little we can do so who would help us and when I say us I'm including myself with the people in the informal sector particularly women and young people who will help us we have to organize ourselves how political parties business interests uh, so that we support the parties who will do what we think should be done. That's how other countries do it. And we have to learn from them. There has to be lawing, there has to be advocacy, there has to be organization. So if I hear you right, Prof, what, I, what I'm getting from what you are saying is that we need, we need to have a second look at our governance system Absolutely. in Africa. Absolutely. Interesting. Why, why are you we that have to have, We have to have organization and interest groups who are able to push and they are respected. If we don't have them, then those who are in power will do whatever they want. Yeah. Interesting. Prof, let's come to the big issue for me, and that is the issue of unemployment. Oh. Unemployment. Unemployment. Unemployment yes. on our continent. Yes. Are you worried about it? Very much. Does it give you sleepless night? Yes. And what can be done about it? Now, I'm talking to you now not just as an economist, but this was a chancellor of my career. If you are worried and you can't sleep about this, what can be done about it, Prof? This is, uh, as you said, gives me sleepless <laughs> nights. I know. <laughs> uh, 
um, from, uh, from my training. Uh, it's one area that uh, has been the major indicator of the state of the economy. Unfortunately, not everyone agrees that employment, rate of employment, and unemployment is the major indicator of how well we are doing. And yet, the, the simple truth is that uh, if you are employed, it means you have a source of income. If you are not employed, you have no income. If you have no income, you have no access to the basic needs yeah. of life. Yeah. As simple as that. Yeah. And sometimes you become, a, you, you become a security threat. Yes, that's true. So we hope that we do not come to that, but it's, that threat is real. Uh, so I believe that, uh, again, we have to, to program our economies. We cannot wait. The, 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 when, when I was in school, they taught us that in the long run, the economy will achieve full employment. <laughs> and so then a new, a new economist called John Maynard Keynes came along and said, in the long run, we're all going to be dead. <laughs> so we better do something now. <laughs> and I believe that uh, the solution is that we have to program our economy so that we match supply with demand by programming, not by chance. Because the paradox that I, I keep seeing is you have all these people who need food, who need clothing, who need shelter, and they are sitting, doing nothing. And you say, but this, how can this be? Why is it that they are not working to produce food? How is it they're not working to produce textiles? To wear? Why is it they're not working to produce housing to live in? Isn't it a paradox? It is. And you know the answer? No. The answer that the typical answer is there's no money. There's no money. I said, but money, I, I, I have been in the central bank and money is printed. Mm. Is it? We don't have printing. printing. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> so the problem is not money. Yeah. The problem is organization. Organization. Because we, we, we teach in elementary economics that money is a medium of exchange. And money itself has no intrinsic value. It is, its value depends on the goods and services that are available for exchange. So our emphasis should be on production and marketing. If we produce, and that is how was the problem during the depression. They were producing, nobody was buying. So they said, give them money so that they can, even if they dig a well and they cover it again, pay them, then they'll go and buy, then the sellers will be encouraged. So I think that we need a bit of awakening on how we organize our economy so that we program production to meet the needs of the people and merely money as a medium of exchange. It, it should not be the excuse for not doing what you're doing, but it is a veil. Uh, I think that one economist said is money is like a veil that covers the face and people cannot see the reality. The reality is the production and feeding the people, not in money. Money is a, a very poor excuse. I, I, I hear you right, Prof. And, and the question that is running through my mind is, are we perhaps giving our youngsters wrong education? I mean, are we giving them the wrong set of education? If you look at the statistics, I mean, I, here in Uganda, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of young people are graduating from our tertiary education system. Same as in the, In fact, it is said that after between between secondary school and university, only about 10 to 15% on the continent gain access to university. Huge chunk of them do not make it to tertiary education. And yet the emphasis on TVET and the rest is that minimal. Are we doing something wrong? Well, 
maybe to some extent, but I, I believe that the the major problem is is where mm. to employ these children and right. who is well, organized right. to employ them. Right. Because why should the children be sitting on the streets and homeless? Is it because of lack of earth to make bricks? Maybe it's, lack of the machine to make the bricks. No, for us, we make the bricks just using uh, pieces of timber. Mm. Maybe, maybe they don't have the, food, the, the initial food to give them that energy. There's, there's a need for some minimal organization. Absolutely. Minimal organization. Mm. That's why, in our case, we have adopted a parish-based model. And my hope is that within the parish, we can organize the demand and supply so that everybody's working and contributing to the needs of the parish. Because the parish is a small area. You can see everybody, it's not an imagination. But you can see who, is house, who doesn't have a house, who doesn't have food, and hopefully you can make an arrangement so that what is produced is much of what is needed. And maybe everybody can be employed. But it, it seems to me the, the difficulty is with the model that we have adopted as a country, as a nation, the Western model of, 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 of economic development. It's too complex, it depends all on, on money, and we don't control, the money is being controlled from outside, and we are saying we are helpless. I think something is wrong, ideologically. Okay, so, so again, I go back to the same question that I've asked. So, we know the problems, it's, we know the solutions. It's a question of connecting the two. Yes. How do we do that, Paul? Because and this issue we are talking about, and by, you know, we've had conversations with different, different people about this same subject of unemployment, the youth, and all of that. It's becoming alarming. I mean, I know in Uganda you are doing quite a lot with your, you know, TVETs and all of those things, which is good. But my question is, is there something else, for example, tertiary education systems can do? Maybe change of uh, curriculum, Instead of emphasizing on the arts, science, arts, arts education, must we now even look at, take a, a different look at the way we train those who come to the universities and all of that? You know, it's not difficult to teach somebody to make bricks. Yes. It's, it's very simple. Yes. Whether he read the biology or he read the philosophy, they, they can, it's not hard to make a brick, but it, there has to be someone to arrange, organize. to organize for the making of the bricks and for the use of the brick to put up a structure. So to me, organization is a problem. Now in the Western economies, the organization is done by the entrepreneur. Entrepreneur is the, the driving force. So, but the entrepreneur needs all the factors of production, his land, labor, and capital. And he then organizes this. So we have land, we have labor, but we don't have capital. And it seems now capital is a problem that we need to resolve. And that's why I told you about the money becoming a problem. Now our banks are for the, the, the big macro. people. Yeah. <laughs> they are very expensive, their loans are very expensive. Even the big people are losing their properties when they borrow because the cost is so high. So our financial sector is actually a problem. It is in foreign hands. I like the, I like the Ethiopian example. In Ethiopia... In Ethiopia, they own all their banks. Yeah, they own all their banks. Yeah, and uh, they are doing well. But they also have high, employment, high unemployment rates. I don't know what the unemployment rate they is. Currently, I'm told it's almost about four, about close to about 18% or something like that. I haven't checked 18. it myself. Yes, I haven't checked it myself. Mm. But I'm told they have a high unemployment rate as well, even though they own all the banks. So why, why is it not working the way we are suggesting here? Well, I, I am not very familiar with their policies, but I would imagine, of course, they have a very high population. I think they're second or third in Africa over 120 or so million. But still, I believe that uh, capital is a requirement. We, we have to have access to capital in order to, to, uh, to organize business. 
And so for us uh, here in Uganda, it, we attempted, when I was Minister of Finance, we tried to use microfinance and savings and credit cooperatives as one way of helping people to access capital. And it has helped thousands, millions, millions. Some of them have become very big, others are still small. But they have regulatory problems, but if you can regulate them properly, it can help a lot in helping the lowest of the lowest to, to be able to access fertilizer, to be able to access pesticides, and, and so on, to be able to have some minimum employment of labor so that they can increase their output. We are talking to Professor Ezra Suroma, the Chancellor of the Makerere University and the former Finance Minister of the Republic of Uganda. We are currently here in the Republic of Uganda having this conversation. This is the Religion and Enterprise Television where we discuss SMEs and how we can empower them to actively participate in the Africa continental free trade area. And here also we talk about the role of faith-based institutions and how they can help in this whole process. Prof, let me focus, let's focus now on faith-based institutions. I like the fact that your father was a catechist. And the last time I, I checked, you have become a preacher yourself. <laughs> Where you give you know, a lot of talks in churches, and, and, and the, which is a commendation. Because I, I tune in one of your presentations where you, where you did about investments. And I was, I was very, very touched and uh, I learned quite a lot. Can you educate us why you do the things you do for the faith-based institutions? particularly in the parishes. Why? The reason for that is that um, I believe that uh, we have clear instruction from uh, our Lord Jesus Christ himself about what we must do as Christians. In Matthew 25, it says, uh, feed the hungry. And he himself did when he was here. Cause the naked. Help uh, those who are sick. Provide shelter for the homeless. So my view is that the church has a responsibility not only to preach about spiritual Riba, which is very important, but you need to go further. When the people you are preaching to are hungry, or homeless, or disabled, can you close your eyes to that fact? I don't think you can. I don't think you should. And so it's my view that the church needs to be conscious of the fact that instead of collecting money from the poor, uh, is it tithing and so on, they should also be saying, how can we help? How can we organize? How can we assist these people to improve the conditions of their lives, to meet their basic needs? Because Jesus talks about whatever you did for the least of these, you did for me. Well, can we look out for the least of these in our churches? In, in Acts chapter 6, we read that the widows uh, in the church at that time from the Hellenistic view, from, from Greece, were being overlooked in the provision of food. And the apostles said, this, we have to do something about this. And they organized, set up a committee of seven people, wise men, to manage that problem. I think that's what we should be doing. We should be seeing how can we assist members in our church, the organizations which are friendly to the church, which are sympathetic to our values, so that they can help the poor. I believe that that is, so when you say faith-based, uh, my understanding is that there are Christians or Muslims who see the need to help the poor, 
who get organized to meet specific problems, just as they did to get people educated, just as they did to help, and they're still doing, to help the sick. I see, so there is already uh, a, an example, an excellent, the, the hospitals and education institutions that are faith-based have done wonderful work. So now can we extend it to Joseph to build food centers, food security centers for our people to, to get into construction? Uh, we get into big construction, but we're always constructing churches. Every time we, we're constructing bigger and bigger churches. But the, the people are homeless in our, in our parish. What are we doing? So I believe that faith-based institutions could set a wonderful example and should with the principles and values of honesty, of, 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 uh, of uh, unity, of maturity, what Paul called the Christian standard. In Ephesus chapter 4, it says, you should live up to the standard which you are called we should live up to the standard of, 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 of uh, helping the others. After all, the second commandment is to love your neighbor. So what are we doing? With, and then we can be now, just as we have uplifted education and health, we can uplift also the standard of living in terms of food and shelter. And I think the country will be better off because I believe the faith-based institutions are very strong and immovable well and well organized. They have the prospect of being well organized. And, and we can work with them. We can, they don't have to be, it doesn't have to be the priest. Right. It's, it's within the church. There are men and women who can do this, what we're doing, and the church gives them moral support. And then we can see ourselves moving forward. So, so, so Prof, if I hear you well, it seems to me what you are saying is that the time has come for faith-based institutions. But, and I must confess that the Muslims are doing it anyway. I'm sure, I mean, of course, you know, Islamic Development Bank is actively involved in development work all across the continent. Uh, some Christian faith, I mean, Christian faith institutions are like the Adventists. They have the, what they call the ADRA, the Adventist Development, something, something, they do that. The Catholic Relief Services, they are doing that. But the question is, and I think you agree with me. Is it time for faith-based institutions to look at the model that have been used so far with regard to their involvement in the economic development of our nations? And I'm asking this question because close to 99% of Africans are religious, either in the church or in the Islamic faith. Yet, apart from, like you mentioned, the educational sector, the health sector, most women who are into SMEs don't have access to capital, as we mentioned, uh, because they don't have collateral. The collaterals are in the name of the males, the, the husbands, and what have you. But both of them are in the church. So let's take it one by one. From the standpoint of financing, and you talked earlier on about the microfinance, about the circles and all of that. Here in Uganda, at least I know of one of such circles, the Millennium uh, 2012 circles, big one. And they are doing fantastic work so from your experience in, in both as an economist and also as a, a, a finance minister, and now, if I may say, a lay preacher, what kind of prescription can you offer faith-based institutions? Only not, not, in, not just in Uganda, but across the continent, of course, using Uganda experience, so that they can look, take a second look at the model that they've used so far in helping develop the people, the people in their parishes? Yes, I, I believe that uh, the, the institutions that the church has so far organized in the form of, church, in the form of uh, educational institutions, primary schools, secondary schools, universities, and uh, hospitals, I believe that same model can work for the production of other products. The same model. You set up an institution, 
it's it's uh, business entity. It is to provide uses, uh, financial statements, just like any other business. So it follows government uh, principles of organization, and 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 it's audited, has a board of directors, so that it is well managed and properly managed, just like any other private sector institution, except that this one has the backing of the church and has responsibility to report to the shareholders who can be mainly, who doesn't, not exclusively, but mainly Christian. So in other words, now Christians should be shareholders in institutions that are deliberately set up not to make money as the first principle, but to help provide vital, essential services to the people. And we find that when these are the values, the purpose, these other things will follow. They will make money. But as one of my, one of, one of my advisors, when we are setting up a bank called Yugaford, it's around, it has 18 branches. We are setting it up as Christian. And we got someone from Australia to come and train us on how to manage growth. I said, sir, we don't have anything. Well, what, what growth are you talking about? He told me something I'll never forget. He said, your problem will not be money. Your problem is that when you get money, you take your eyes from the giver of the money to the money. You forget to go and now just follow the money. There's always that temptation. So, but I have seen what he said has come true. We saw ourselves, we started with almost nothing. We saw ourselves making billions and billions. Then people said, now we must become a bank like anybody else. And, and it's a long story. But it is possible. The, the point is that by coming together, we can form institutions. But most important, of course, there is always this temptation to follow money and forget about, about God. Hopefully, the, the church being there will keep reminding. There will always be some people follow more of the money than, than God. But we will be reminded that this is not why we exist. We exist in order to serve people. And I believe we can go very far in this continent. Let me mention, some people forget, the Protestant ethic in America. Isn't it behind the development of that country? Absolutely. Absolutely. It is that ethic which has yeah. built America. Yeah. Even America, yes. That's the foundation yeah. sure. of that economy. Right. And we can copy mm. that mm. in Africa. So, so right now, if you look at Africa, every corner, and this is, this is not to say that, you know, we people should not set up churches and what have you, but do you think there's a need for discipline the system a bit? I mean, there are instances where you find pastors telling people to eat grass and drink uh, all kinds of concussions because they say that, you know, God has spoken to them and all of that. Do you think there should be some sort of discipline? Yeah, I think so. And how can we go about doing that? Um, that's a difficult question. For me, it's not my area of expertise. But uh, I believe that... Uh, within the constitution of every country, there should be some limits to how far you can go and uh, what expertise or knowledge or qualifications you need in order to become a leader of, of, of a church or an organization. Mm -hmm. But that's not my area. I, I, and I respect that, Prof. Do you think Christians, I know the Muslims are already doing it, and they don't shy away from it, you think Christians should be involved in active politics? Earlier on, I, talk, I talked about the Christian yes. standard. Yes. If you yourself, you were into, into politics. Yes, I did. Yes. Um, because uh, the problem was overwhelming in Uganda in 1979, 1980, after Idi Amin had been overthrown. We went into chaos. I would be teaching in my career and guns would be going off everywhere. And I said, how, how do you expect children to learn? 
when bombs are going all over the place, people are getting killed. And uh, when one of the professors said if uh, intelligent people refuse to join politics, they must accept to be ruled by fools. So if Christians don't go into politics, they must be accept to be ruled by non-Christians. And that means their principles may be totally in disagreement. And of course, in this case, in Uganda, we have the case of the Uganda martyrs who were killed because of their faith. So uh, I believe that uh, the Christian standard is important, a standard of honesty, a standard of uh, peace, of unity, of forgiveness, we need an organization that is based on such principles. We are witnessing, as I speak, some measure of disintegration in some of our political parties. And when I was asking myself, what will be the basis of a party that is together, that is united? It is the presence of such principles, of honesty, of, of forgiveness, of dependability that can give people the strength to remain united, to converse freely, and, and, and to keep moving toward a purpose, a direction for which they are set up and not give up. Now, I have seen, I think in Germany you have a social de Christian Democratic Party or something like that. So it's not totally unheard of. One would argue their culture is different from our, from our culture. The, the what? I say one would argue that their culture is different, is different from African cultures. I, I, but here we're talking about changing the culture. We never had political parties before. <laughs> now we do. We do. Things have changed. Yeah. Democracy has come right. as an idea. Right. And the question now is, how do we really strengthen this democracy? Mm. And I believe Christians can play an important role in making sure that there's good governance. Mm. So when we say, thy kingdom come, mm. it is the kingdom needs to be with us. And then we bring it to the world. It doesn't take for God himself to come. Mm. The, the kingdom is in us. Right. And we are the ones to see that this kingdom of honesty, of peace, Absolutely. of sincerity right. is actually being practiced mm. in the world. Mm. So I, yes, I believe that Christians Christian should go into politics. Should go into politics. Wonderful. This is Religion and Enterprise Television, where we talk about SMEs and how they can participate in the Africa Continental Free Trade Area. And we are talking to the Chancellor of Makerere University, Professor Ezra Surema, who is also the former finance minister of the Republic of Uganda. Prof, are you hopeful about the future of Africa? That's a hard question. <laughs> I pray <laughs> very hard for the future of Africa and for Africans. Um, of course, we see we've been through very, very difficult times. We've been through slavery, we've been through colonialism. Uh, but other countries also have been through difficult times and they have survived. So I think we too will survive. But this doesn't mean that we will be suffering free. We shall suffer, we continue to suffer. But there is uh, learning that comes from suffering. As we suffer, we become stronger. Not that I want suffering for its own sake, but I recognize that it has a reality and I'm not discouraged because of suffering. Many of us as individuals, we are here not because we didn't suffer, but perhaps because we did. And despite the suffering, we, we emerged. And uh, uh, we read in, in the Bible that uh, suffering does not mean that God has abandoned us. We, in fact, uh, in Romans 8, 36, um, Paul tells us that we must be ready to face death every moment of the day. That we are like sheep waiting to be slaughtered. But that doesn't mean we should stop living. 
We live on, but we trust that God is with us and on our side. He will help us. He will keep us. Despite the many, many trials, we are still conquerors and we will be conquerors. Interesting. So I will not give up on Africa. So you are, you are hopeful. I'm very hopeful. Very hopeful. Yes. I, like your, I like your optimism. And, and, and if you look at the aspiration five of the Agenda 2063, it talks about, I mean, aspiration four says, a peaceful and secure Africa by 2063. Africa will emerge as a peaceful and secure continent. A continent which is, con which is conflict free continent with harmony and understanding among communities at the grassroots level and institutional play. Today, there's a lot going on on the continent. Yes. So when you say you're optimistic, let's take West Africa, for example. In the last couple of months, AU has said gun free, but we have all kinds of coups and all of that. Apart from that, internal conflicts all over Africa. How do we address these things? Seems to be the history of the world. <laughs> Not only in Africa, but the whole world. There is always conflict within the country and among the countries. So I, I will not be discouraged because of conflict. It's not because I want it, but when it occurs, it occurs and we hope that it can be resolved but, of course, uh, the principles I talked about earlier, the Christian principles, we hope that they would be shared by more and more people so that love will be replaced in conflict. If I love you, I sacrifice and I forgive. But if I don't, I fight. So there is room for improvement, there is room for changing of hearts. And I think the hope that I see, the possibility of hope comes from faith in God. It, it cannot, where else will it come from? Prof, throughout my interactions with you, informally and all of that, what question that keeps ringing my mind, how many of the young politicians, the young professionals, seek your audience, seek audience with you to, to, to learn from your expertise and experiences. Not just Uganda. Let me, let's use Uganda as an example. Do they come to you? Some. Some. Some come. You know why I'm asking the question? The reason why I'm asking the question is I'm leading you to another question. If you look at what is happening among our young people today, all over the continent, the issue of attitude is a big issue, isn't it? Mm. So what can be done about it? And it's only Uganda. What can Africans do? You have young politicians who are, when it comes to experience, next to nothing, but unfortunately happen to play critical roles in political parties of our governance systems. So what can we do to address the issue of the attitude all across, be it lack of hard work, non-ethics, and everything. What can we do? And what can faith-based institutions do with regard to that as well? I try to be an optimist Always. rather than a pessimist. Not that pessimism fight to take me over, but I fight it and uh, believe that uh, uh, within the human heart there is uh, that possibility of love and, and of hope, of kindness. So I'm not giving up on, on, on our people. Uh, and I believe that uh, in order to, to organize and get people together, you must have some principles around which you organize them. Uh, I don't see us moving forward without organization. But the question is, how do you organize? On what principles? On what basis? Is it only hatred and, 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 and uh, fighting? Or is it that there are some things you want to achieve 
which people believe in and support you for. That's what I hope that um, throughout, throughout the world, not, not, of course, uh, some countries you would say their political systems are more advanced. But if you look at America, for example, I see that they are also divided. There's a tremendous conflict there. You know what they call democracy. There are many, many issues that are raised, but you don't, you don't give up because of that. And I think in every country, you'll find that. You'll find that there are conflicts within and without, uh, but that does not give, make me give up on mankind. I'll keep hoping and I keep praying and I keep teaching what I believe to be right. And I hope that one by one, we can be convinced Absolutely. to do what is Absolutely. right. Absolutely. So sometimes when I, when I look at you, you know, uh, from a distance anyway, I ask myself, I wish that, you know, all academics, all professionals would have the kind of optimism that you have. Because I've listened to you deliver speeches sometimes, and, and I like the way you, you, you are so optimistic. So, Prof, my, my question, then my next question to you is, what has been, if, if somebody asks you to share with us your cardinal value systems and principles, maybe two or three of them, what would that be? Very simple. Mm -hmm. Loving God, loving each other. That's it. <laughs> You know what I say? That's what I'm telling you. You know, you, you, you're, you're very amazing. Uh, and I'm not flattering you, Prof. I am, I, am, I am tempted to ask a bit about your family, but I don't know whether you're comfortable with that. Prof, I, I'm, 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 I'm emotional about this because we are losing our families. We are losing our families because of economic pressure. People leave home like 4 a.m., they come back home like 10 p.m. Their children are being taken care of either by television or house helps and whatever. What must the African do in this era of technology and economic heart pressures to keep the family strong and going like you have done? Well, I, I on my own, I'm not able to do anything. Um, but as uh, is often said, your children look at you, your wife looks at you, and your behavior, your actions tell it all. It's one thing what you say, up to a point what you say matters. You say good things, you say positive things, your children, your wife, your relatives, they hear them. But also what you do, what they see you doing. If they see you working hard, they work hard. If they see you sitting back, they also want to sit back and relax. So I, I believe that the family is fundamental in, in this uh, relationship, in this situation. And uh, there are no simple answers to the economic problems, as we have seen. I talk a lot about social protection, where we should try to ensure that everyone in our society does not go below the human standard, in the, in the, to live in a subhuman state. I talk a lot about this. And that's where the church also comes in, because we want that human standard to be observed. That, that, that people are sleeping on the street. I was happy to see our KCCA, our city authority, taking the children off the street and take them somewhere where they can start learning and being organized to do something that will give them hope in the future. Because you're on the street, what future do you have? So it's not a simple question. But I, I believe uh, in God, and I, my experience 
is that God will not abandon me. And he has never abandoned me. I've been in situations where I wanted to commit suicide. And God stepped in, in time, and saved me. Is it is this something confidential or you, you don't mind sharing it? The situation? I, I was on, when in November, December 1975, mm. I was attempting to complete my doctoral thesis. Mm. And I had run out of money. My career had stopped paying me because I was supposed to have come back in August. And when I didn't, they cut me off. So I used the little money I had saved. And by December, the money ran out. My major advisor said he was satisfied with my work. But one of my advisors said he was not satisfied. I tried to explain to him, I have run out of money. I have nowhere to go. What can I do? He said, here are more books. Go and read them and write another chapter. So I contemplated. When I left his office, walking to the dormitory, I wanted to commit suicide. I didn't see any option left for me. When I reached the, the, the dormitory, I found a small piece of paper, a telegram. In those days, we were using telegram. And I picked it, I said, come, your job is waiting. What kind of timing is that? The people where I had taught in 1973 in Florida, the dean had sent this telegram. I don't know about why did it come then? Just when I had decided to take my life. I just picked it up. I had just enough money to put enough fuel in the car and drive down and start working. And for two months, I had forgetting about the PhD. After two months, I said, let me see what these books. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> well, and, and satisfy this, 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 anyway? this advisor. <laughs> yes, and they were very good books. That's right. And he was showing me that my thesis was tilted well, one side towards capitalism, I don't consider socialism. I need it to be more balanced. So I wrote a new chapter and completed my PhD. But the timing of that telegram is what amazes me. Prof, it is said that what lasts most it's not the buildings we leave behind. I say what lasts most are not the buildings we leave behind, not the properties we leave behind, but what we pass on to generations yet unborn. My question for you is, if she's my last question, how would Professor Suroma would want to be remembered? Not only in Uganda, but all across the world when it's no more. I hope that uh, the people who read about me will say that uh, this man loved God and served God and served his people, committed, was committed, and he served faithfully. That's all. Interesting. Prof, that's the lead camera. We've had a long conversation covering so many things on our continent and Uganda. We talked about your family. You've been we've been we have been privileged enough and very, you know, humbled by your willingness to share a bit into your private life with us here. Assuming you were put, God made a plan for you to be on a stage where from where you stand, you can see the whole continent all the 54 or 55 nations of the continent. You have all the governors, the politicians, but particularly the youth and the women all looking at you. And they wanted you to, God wanted you to give them your parting words to them. If you can look in that camera and speak to these young people 
with your wisdom, expertise, everything, what would you tell them? I can only speak from my experience. And my experience is that ever since I committed my life to God in 1960, He has guided me, He has protected me, and He has uplifted me, and I have no regret. So I'm very grateful to God for what He has done, and I can say with confidence that anyone who does the same will have a similar experience as I have had. Thank you. I don't know what to say again, and I'm just lost with words. This is an accomplished economist, a man that has seen it all, risen from what we'll call from nothing to where God has placed him, a former finance minister, and currently the chancellor of Makerere University for such a long time telling us that Africa, there's hope. We shouldn't give up because Africa indeed is the future of the world. And that in everything that we do, we must remember that if we want to go far, we should stretch forth our hands into the arms of God. And he is the only one that can take us where he wants us to be. This has been Religion and Enterprise Television. And in case you have not subscribed to this channel, please do so and let's all share the link among our networks and groups so that we can spread the news that Africa is on the rise to become the hope of the world. Prof, it's been an honor and a great privilege having you on this show. And I can't say thank you enough. Thank you very much, Prof. Thank you very much. For coming. Africa, Africa needs you. Needs you.